Hi everyone, um, my name's Tim Forsman and I'm here with Matt Caruana, hi Matt, and Matt Lotta, hi Matt, and we're hi, doing Matt. a little video session podcast, uh, we're calling it um, Bones and Stones, and it's just sort of stimulated by the lockdown, by the fact that we're all stuck at home, and we thought we'd chat about archaeology, um, to hopefully create a bit of a discussion with some of our students and colleagues, uh, and um, hopefully also chat about some interesting things. So today, to start, we decided that we'd talk about how we each got into archaeology. And I think we could probably, let's move from further away from home and begin with Matt Caruana and hear what he has to say about getting into archaeology. All right. Well, thanks, Tim. Um, so I, I got into archaeology through a very nonlinear route. Um, I, I did not have any interest in going into archaeology when, uh, when I was beginning my, my college career in the United States. I'm from Los Angeles originally. So I was first uh, at a, a junior college in Long Beach and then went to UCLA. Um, and I was really interested in cultural anthropology there. So um, actually in the cultural uses of hallucinogens, if I'm to be completely honest. So um, not, not untypical for a boy from LA. <laughs> Anyways, um, I wanted to, to continue with that uh, after my undergraduate degree. Um, but uh, the a program I was interested in, which was sort of uh, running uh, a field school in ethnography down in the um, uh, sort of like uh, area of South America, Brazil, uh, that got canceled. Uh, and so I, I had to sort of reevaluate. Um, I spent a couple of years after my, my undergraduate just sort of uh, working in the private sector and then I decided that I was going to make a leap and, and go to graduate school and I applied to University of Manchester in England for a degree in archaeology and uh, much of that was really motivated on the fact that I had a really good sort of professor of archaeology, uh, Gail Kennedy, um, when I was going to UCLA and she, she really got me interested in those topics. Topics. And so I decided to take the leap and um, Manchester accepted me right away. I wanted to do something in rock art, actually, because of a fellow named Thomas Dowson. Who was at that university, a big computer glitch. Um, and so it was our first time running online um, registration and a lot of the classes that I enrolled for actually were not being offered whatsoever. So I had to switch gears. And um, I, I ended up with a guy named Tim Insole, and I, my focus was more in Paleolithic archaeology. So I looked at stone tools um, and the differences between cognition between modern humans and Neanderthals. Um, I then finished my, my master's. I wanted to stick around in the UK, but um, I didn't really have much prospects for PhD. Came back to Los Angeles, um, again worked in the private sector, and then I finally contacted um, a woman named Lucinda Backwell in South Africa who accepted me for a, a PhD. I was funded through PAST and uh, I came here. I've been here for 10 years now. And um, yeah, I've- uh, a very difficult 10 years for us. <laughs> Indeed it has. So <laughs> all, of the, all of the field work we have done together in the last, yeah, nine to 10 years, I do feel sorry for both of you guys. <laughs> that can ask a question, um, just something that like confused me, even today, still confuses me, and it definitely confused me at first. In the States, you did cultural anthropology, right? Yeah. So why, what is the difference? Because there's various types of anthropology in the States, and archaeology is also an anthropology in the States. Yeah. So in the United States, they practice what's called the four-field approach when you're discussing anthropology. And that's typically cultural anthropology, biological, linguistics, and archaeology. And the idea there is the connection is, is that these are sort of the, uh, the human sciences, in a sense. It's all um, structured under the broad category of social science. We don't really have that here in South Africa. Most archaeology departments are either based solidly in sciences or in humanities. Um, so in that, that's, that's the connection is, is in the States, they see the sort of human uh, sciences as a part of a social science and archaeology is lumped within that uh, because it's looking essentially at culture in the same way and does, you know, borrow upon theories of, of uh, cultural anthropology in some ways. However, it's just looking at the sort of extinct forms or past forms of. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
and then also sorry to ask another question but did your interest in the the stone age of southern africa or africa was that sort of kicked off by your work in the paleolithic is that where you started to expand and look at these other regions as well or uh, so my, my original focus was, was actually in East Africa, you know, in, in the United States, that's a very common thing because a lot of Americans do uh, field work in, in East Africa. Um, so when I contacted Lucinda Backwell, it was at the, the uh, recommendation of, of uh, Professor Gail Kennedy. Um, so I went into her office and I was kind of thinking, hey, I want to get back into the PhD. Uh, would you have any recommendations? And she said, look at this person's work. Before I came to South Africa, I had absolutely no clue about the South African archaeological record whatsoever or that it would be as exciting as it is. Uh, I was really trying to, to focus in East Africa, but um, you, you know, in the States, you have to pass a sort of graduate requi requisite exam to get into um, graduate school, and I am absolutely horrible at standardized testing. So I wasn't able to make the grade, so to speak. But in South Africa, um, we don't have those types of, of restrictions or regulations. So um, yeah, it was just sort of uh, um, uh, uh, an easy choice for me. Cool. Uh, Kerry, could I just ask one one question as well, maybe just to, to end off. Um, in terms of your interest uh, from a Stone Age Paleolithic point of view, um, you know, what made you get into older one studies as opposed to maybe looking at younger or older periods uh, within the Stone Age? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I, I've always been interested in the question of, of human evolution, and I find the sort of earlier side of human evolution to be much more interesting, actually, than the sort of later half of it when you're talking about modern humans. Uh, in my personal opinion, um, by the time modern humans come onto the landscape, uh, you know, say 300,000 years ago, everything in human evolution that's interesting has already happened, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find it really fascinating that these sort of like earlier forms of Homo and late Australopithecines had absolutely nothing to, to sort of grow on, no background knowledge, no nothing. They were innovating these interesting ways of making stone tools, of using stone tools without any sort of, um, you know, form cultural knowledge if you might if you might say much of our our you know technological superiority in the animal kingdom nowadays is based upon the fact that we have these extensive records you know we write things down we remember history we build upon that knowledge and we innovate forms that are that are really interesting um, you know we got to the moon because we have jet propulsion um, and all of that stems back to the idea that that you know we wanted to make airplanes to fly um, and and you don't have that in those sort of earlier forms of, of hominins um, and I just find it intensely interesting that they were able to exist on this really dangerous landscape two million years ago and innovate ways to to get food and to survive interesting well, I'm, I'm glad you weren't going to suggest that it was the older one that got us to the moon, but that was very interesting. <laughs> I can draw a line. I can draw a, a real linear graph showing that. <laughs> uh, without the cleaver, we never would have got there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, thanks, Kara. That was really interesting. Uh, Lots, how about you? How did you get into this field? Yeah, so I mean, uh, my uh, um, kind of upbringing, uh, you know, I was raised, born and raised in Johannesburg. Uh, so I am a, a, a local boy, you could say. Um, you know, being uh, um, uh, young, I mean, my parents, I was very fortunate enough to go on uh, lots of day trips and stuff and holidays and, and all that. And a, a large component of those holidays was obviously spending time outdoors, going to places like the Michalisburg, you know, hiking around, going to places like the Drakensberg, uh, just kind of, you know, exploring the landscape. And I think, you know, from very early on, um, I just got a you know, keen interest in the landscape. Uh, keen interest in you know animals insects anything that was you know to do with the kind of natural environment um, at least I was more focused on the natural environment back then you know issues of, of climate and weather all of those things kind of started interesting you know being interesting to me you know from a very young age um, so at least that that kind of cultivated that very early on you know as a kid I also used to play with dinosaurs in the back garden not that that's related to archaeology in any way but just that kind of uh, appreciation for you know some kind of uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the landscape out there. So then, um, you know, fast forward to university, I didn't really, you know, I went through obviously high school and stuff and I didn't really know coming out of high school what I wanted to study. Um, I took a gap year and then uh, at the end of it, you know, went to WITS registration on day one and uh, walked into orientation day trying to figure out what student, uh, sorry, what subjects I was going to register for. Because um, I wasn't really sure, you know, I knew that I was going to do a Bachelor of Science degree but I just didn't know what I was going to specialize in. I really enjoyed doing geography at school. 
Um, so, you know, as a subject, that's where, you know, climate and weather and geomorphology all came in. So I knew that that was going to be one of my majors, but then I was trying to fish around for another one. And originally I was going to do something along the lines of biology. So I registered, registered for biology. I think they called it ILS or CLS back then. Um, that was a big mistake. Um, and then I walked to the archaeology uh, desk and I was like, wow, what is this subject archaeology? And I didn't really know much about it. And um, at the time, Professor Ben Smith was sitting at the uh, orientation desk. Uh, he, he at the time was the director of RARI, the Rock Art Research Institute at, at WITS. And I just sat down with him and I said, you know, look, what is, what is this all about? I could see that geography and archaeology were part of the same school. And I think that's what possibly swayed me as well. Um, it seemed as if the two disciplines would work hand in hand, which appealed to me. Um, so, sorry, I'm just getting a box popping up here on my computer. So anyway, so I sat down with him and, and, and spoke to him and he was extremely approachable, very friendly and just said, look, this is what we do. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time in the field. We investigate cultural landscapes, et cetera, et cetera. And he gave me a kind of, you know, the quick two minute breakdown of what archaeology is. And it sounded fantastic. So I said to him, great, well, sign me up. So that was kind of, you know, um, day, day one for me. Um, and then, you know, I was still trying to figure out if archaeology was for me. And then I had the first lecture with Professor Amanda Esterhazen uh, doing our garbology course, which for some of us who've gone through the bit system will know well, it's pretty much one of the first things we do as a, as a bits undergrad. Um, and, you know, you think, well, what is this garbology about? And, you know, when she explained just simple concepts of looking at, you know, the material culture that we leave behind as humans and what that can tell us about uh, in terms of our subsistence habits, our behaviors, it was so interesting, you know, to, to look at that. And I was pretty much sold from day one thanks to Amanda Esterhazen's uh, lecture. And it's been, yeah, it's been downhill since then, obviously. Obviously, we've been in the field together doing lots of field schools and stuff. And I think, um, you know, the my interest in geography and then archaeology together is what got me along the path of doing geoarchaeology. Um, and then also having done geology undergrad at WITS as well. Um, that's what kind of got me into, you know, the whole rock side of things as well. And that feeds into the, the lithics too. So, yeah, that's my kind of story. So just correct me if I'm wrong here, but geoarchaeology is one of those made up things that people who like to play in sand pits come up with after they get degrees, right? <laughs> or could you just explain it a bit better than that, maybe? <laughs> pretty, pretty much so. So I mean, look, geoarchaeology is, um, it's obviously a form of, a form of archaeology, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's a sub-discipline of archaeology that feeds into other earth sciences. So that's where geology comes in, geomorphology comes in. Uh, it's essentially investigating paleo landscapes. Uh, essentially looking at how landscapes evolved and developed through time. A lot of what we do as well is investigating the context of archaeological sites. Um, you know, when we excavate archaeological deposits, you know, knowing how the artifacts got there is very important. Um, knowing how old the artifacts are as well is very important in terms of how we establish our chronologies um, and how we compare sites, how we compare archaeological materials. So chronology is very important. So all of that feeds into context. So I think that appealed to me because... You, you know, for me, the first step in any kind of archaeological situation comes back to um, geoarchaeology, site formation to some degree. For example, if you walk up to a rock art site, you know, your first question is going to be, oh, great, you know, the rock art is preserved here. Why is it preserved here versus not in the boulder around the corner where there's a massive shelter? And that's where you can start investigating things, um, you know, like drip lines and, and erosion and, and weathering and stuff like that. So it's really kind of um, you know, phase A of the analysis. Um, and it starts off with very basic questions, and then you can really start getting into some more detailed stuff. And it then feeds into your interpretations with the cultural material. And that's where the kind of geoarchaeology aspect that the two kind of um, approaches feed hand in hand. I remember a lot of just. Sorry, Carol. Sorry, Tim. Um, just, just to, to um, try to gain some more clarity on that point. So, um, you know, l looking at the cultural material and, and the, the context of it, um, you know, we rely heavily on, on uh, sort of interpretations of lithic artifacts to understand cultural materials in, in deep time. Um, so could you just maybe touch very quickly upon the point about how the context and site formation uh, plays into the interpretation specifically of lithic analysis and, and interpreting, you know, sort of cultural materials? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, um, to touch back onto some of the stuff that you were talking about, about East Africa and your, your initial kind of interest started off in East Africa. There's been some pioneering work that's been done looking at uh, lithic replication studies and how that feeds into site formation. So, um, a researcher by the name of uh, Kathy Schick 
Um, she did some seminal work uh, at Olduvai Gorge, looking at how when stone tools are actually napped and produced, let's say if you have a core and a hammerstone, and you then um, you know, take your hammerstone, nap it, nap it, knock it against the core, and, and knock off a series of flakes. Through experiments and simulations, they've been able to work out the size percentage of material that actually comes off of a, a stone artifact. We can then investigate, um, you know, when we excavate these uh, assemblages, what percentage of that material has been lost? Because we know that, you know, rocks will break and fracture in a predictable way. Uh, there will be a certain percentage of material which comes off of a core. Um, and then when we then excavate archaeological deposits and we see that a certain component uh, of that material is missing, let's say the smaller component, um, we will then, you know, presumably understand that the smaller component will be uh, subjected to erosion more easily. If you have small little flakes sitting on the surface of uh, a landscape, you know, wind can come along, blow those small fragments away, you can have surface wash washing those pieces away. Those pieces can be removed completely from the landscape, they can be reconcentrated elsewhere. Um, so yes, there's different things that have been uh, looked that specific, that's obviously just one example from, from Olduvai Gorge. Um, there's been other studies by Michael Petraglia and, and Potts, for example, also at Olduvai, looking at the specific orientation of artifacts, how um, artifacts will orientate uh, within a landscape on specific paleo surfaces if they've been affected by things like water. Um, and that will affect how the actual artifacts sit in the ground. Um, and there's obviously various analyses that you know, feed in hand in hand to kind of tease out those patterns. And we can then work out the uh, context of those assemblages being primary, secondary, or completely modified. Cool. Thanks, Matt. That's really interesting. Uh, and it's funny because I had some similar experiences at WITS as well when I was getting, getting amongst it. Um, but how I got into to archaeology <clears throat> uh, was a bit different. When I was young, like Matt Lotter, I also spent a lot of time outdoors and, and developed an interest in that. And then I um, started, I was given one of these lovely informative alien theory books, um, how the aliens built the pyramids and, you know, developed technology on earth. And I started reading them and I read quite a few of them. And that's really what got me interested in archaeology. When I got to Wits with a number of these books under my belt and a I was very keen on changing the minds of everyone that these guys are actually correct. I, I registered for anthropology and I wanted to register for English because I wanted to learn how to write properly and um, which I still don't think I've done. And um, I was told that I shouldn't do English because I will learn to write in whatever course I end up registering and rather do archaeology because it's similar to anthropology. And, and Kara, this is, was my confusion because I'd read these books that spoke about anthropology as archaeology. So when I got there, I thought, hey, I want to do archaeology. But in my mind, anthropology was archaeology. So, so day one, I got into the archaeology class and I sat there and thought, OK, thank you to that person, because this is actually what I wanted to do. And I would have been completely wrong if, if, I'd, if I'd gone down the alien theory books in more way than one. <laughs> so I started doing archaeology. Also, Prof. Esther Hazen was my lecturer. Very quickly realized that, you know, archaeology is it's based on empirical evidence. It's based on scientific principles and procedures. And, and as much as many of these books like to slate archaeologists, um, the way that they go about their business is, you know, following the principles of science. And so I very quickly realized that although I still sometimes look back and appreciate some of those books for the entertainment that they're worth, I don't really subscribe to them in any way or form. So that's how I got, in, got into archaeology was through these alien theories. Um, and then in my, what really sort of solidified everything for me was in my third year of archaeology. In fact, it was with Lotto. We did some work at a site called Canteen Copy, which we're still working at now. Um, and was, uh, going through the later Stone Age sequence there. So the, the hunter-gatherer uh, occupation of that site from last few hundred years up to the last few thousand years, uh, that's something that started getting me really interested. So I realized that I wanted to study later Stone Age, which is you know much later than what you guys study, as you know. And then during our honors year, we went up to the Mapungubwe landscape uh, with Prof. Tom Huffman, and we did five weeks of work up there. And that, that landscape was just amazing. It was a beautiful place, incredible archaeology. And while I was there on that, on that trip, I read a, a paper by Simon Hall and, and Ben Smith uh, entitled Empowering Places. And that paper really, and the, the ideas in that paper resonated with the type of the interest that I had for the latest Stone Age. Contact, interaction, uh, social change, and such things. And that's what got me into into archaeology so it sort of began with aliens but i'm i'm pleased to say it ended with you know sensible archaeology <laughs> yeah no, so so just a question about um your kind of progression from school to, to university 
I seem to remember a while back when we spoke about this, um, you had a teacher that inspired you at school, didn't you? Somebody who kind of encouraged you to read books and stuff or am I, am I wrong or uh, it was you, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I know you're right. In fact, and he was my accounting teacher um, uh-huh. and he was, I, I was useless at accounting, absolutely useless. Um, and he would sit with me after school and help me out and he got me through and he was a great teacher and, and he had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, not dad jokes 100% all the way, um, but he was great. And yeah, he did encourage me to read and he encouraged me to think outside the box. My uncle was actually the one who gave me the, the alien theory books. Um, and that, that sort of obviously set me on a path, you know, to where I ended up now. Um, so yeah, definitely someone at school. We were, we were very lucky enough that school also organized a trip to Egypt, which I was able to participate on. And it was during that time as well, seeing the pyramid, seeing this incredible archeology span up there and this beautiful history, that sort of made me realize this is something that I, I really enjoyed. So, yeah. Just to uh, maybe bring up another question, which uh, for the people that are listening to this audio and watching this video often uh, brings up a lot of debate between the three of us is, Tim, why did you get involved in the later Stone Age and not uh, you know, some, some real archeology? span We're talking stuff a little bit, <laughs> a little bit older, earlier Stone Age. So why the, why the decision to move into the later Stone Age? Obviously you've you know, now progressed. We look at a range of other things as well, but yeah, why the LSA? I wanted to settle for the best, Matt. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go to an archaeological site where you dig for 14 years and you bring up 182 big, crude, <laughs> lumpy rocks that apparently are still in the world that you can't really do any analysis on. <laughs> I'd rather work at a site where there's a ray. No, I'm just joking, and I know you are too. Well, what I like about the LSA, and it's something that you don't necessarily get in a lot of the other industries and, and excavations, is the, is the state of preservation is really cool because the stuff's only been lying there in some instances for a few hundred years, a few thousand years. So you have wonderful preser- preservation at a lot of these sites and you have an incredible array of artifacts to play around with um, from glass beads that are being imported into Southern Africa, ostrich eggshell beads, cone shells, uh, stone tools, obviously, which is what got me into this in the first place. Rock art, also, that's part of the later Stone Age. Um, at some of the sites, leather, leather preservation is still high. So there's clothing, there's shoes. I mean, there's a really uh, incredible botanical remains and faunal remains. So there's a huge um, sort of assemblage that we get to, to play around with. And I think that's, that's what interests me as well. But look, you know, like with all of us, we, we have, uh, sometimes I wonder why, why I'm interested in all of this anyway, you know, because <laughs> you could fall into any pool from rock art to historic archaeology, Iron Age, yet we've, we've all sort of settled on something in the Stone Age. Um, and it probably comes down to the people who inspired us. You know, so, well. I, I have another reason why Tim really likes the LSA is because he only has to dig 10 centimeters into the ground to get his assemblage. That's Laura, right. how, how, how deep were some of your pits at, uh, at uh, Sunday's River? Sunday's three and a half, four meters. Four meters, yeah. That's, that's called uh, some proper spade and shovel work there. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's an attention span thing, probably. Uh, I, after about half a meter, I lose interest. Maybe that's what it is. I mean, <laughs> I know you guys are struggling through the LSA at a rapid rate, and, I, and, I, and, I, and you can't deny that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. No. but yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's cool that you guys want to go deep, if that's what matters to you. <laughs> no, but I think uh, uh, just, just uh, if I can jump in here as well, um, you know, having worked a little bit more on the Lesotho stuff now, Tim, uh, you know, working in Lesotho, mm-hmm. the assemblages there were absolutely fantastic. And I understand exactly why, so, you know, people are interested in the LSA. You know, there's so much going on in the landscape. Um, and al- although we know that there is complexity in the landscape when we're talking about the ESA and the MSA, mm-hmm. you know, from a later Stone Age point of view, that, that better preservation coupled with the fact that you then have better preservation of organics and there is a range of material, cultural material, within yeah. the assemblages where you can look at ranging uh, transport between groups, yeah. seasonal mobility. I mean, that is just it really, really, really is interesting. I, I think another benefit too is, um, is there's not the massive leap in sort of middle range theory when you're looking at human behavior that you have to apply to the ESA. Yeah. We're talking about homo uh, or gaster or homo erectus and making stone tools. You know, we do infer a lot, um, almost sort of like an anthropogenic projection on what the sort of uh, capacities for tool making actually mean in the real world. Mm. Whereas with the LSA, obviously, you know, we know that they're, they're humans like us. And mm. so uh, the anthropological sort of literature and, and theory base, um, I think can be wielded a, 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 lot, a lot more yeah. efficiently in yeah. that context. I mean, the whole ethnographic record that we have, especially with rock art studies, yeah. 
provides us an incredible insight into, you know, okay, we can debate this. I mean, we, people have been debating it since the 80s, but it provides us wonderful insight into how people live their lives and how these hunter-gatherers lived on our landscapes and, you know, how they yeah. associated some symbolic devices with belief systems and tiers of their cosmology and so on. And we have access to all of that, which is great. But guys, I think we yeah. need to wrap up. We've been chatting for quite long. Um, yeah, I was, long yeah. Before, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say we were just coming on about 25 minutes there. So yeah, so it is a, it's a bit <laughs> So I think we should cut it off there. Um, but hopefully for anyone watching and listening, this was interesting to you. I think you probably all have your own stories and feel free to share them with us. It'd be interesting, especially um, the students that we work with to hear what you guys think and, and how you got into this field um, is, will be, is very interesting to us. Um, and we all have our own stories. Um, but we will continue with this conversation. We will, we've touched on a few issues. I think that'll come up again and again in, in ongoing um, chats. Um, and hopefully in the next few days, we'll have another one up uh, on something more centered around a paper or a question or an experience or maybe an interview with another archeologist, but it'll be up there. We'll circulate it far and wide. Um, have a listen, enjoy, be safe during the lockdown. And we look forward to seeing you all back in class. Cheers. Great, cheers. Thanks so much.